Friends, I'm going to invite us to join together in prayer. Let's pray. We give you thanks, O God, for these ancient stories handed down to us throughout the generations, for the ways in which they have informed our ancestors in the faith who have come before us and the ways they inform us still today, right here, right now. Help us, O God, to find our space within your ever-unfolding narrative that we might deeply ground ourselves in you. Bless, O God, the words of my mouth, the hearts and minds and souls that hear them and help turn them into action. Amen. So this is our fourth week of talking about Job, of of sitting in the story of Job and everything that goes along with that. For three weeks, we've watched Job become increasingly frustrated and the things that he put value upon in his life be stripped away piece by piece by piece until there's nothing left. We literally find Job in a pile of ash and sackcloth screaming at God and accusing God of all kinds of things. Along the way, we've, we've encountered some friends of Job, and even his spouse, and, and they are all encouraging him to just give it up. The phrase over and over becomes, Job, just, just curse God and die. Stop trying to, to believe in this God of yours. Stop trying to, to communicate with God. Just, just give it up, Job. Just, just let it go. And then just just die. Over and, and over again, we see this cosmic play that has Job as a center figure. And more and more and more seems to be visited upon Job to challenge his faith and get him to walk away from God. There's been 41 chapters like that including four chapters where God finally does respond to Job, but probably not in the way that we've anticipated because he responds to Job and she says, where were you when I was busy making the world? Where were you when I made the mountains and set the edges of oceans? Where were you when I dotted stars across the sky and set suns and planets in their orbits? What were you up to, Job? Who are you to question me. Now, I don't know about you, but if I've read a a book and and that's been literally 99% of it, then when I get to the last chapter, I want to somehow feel it all get resolved in in a satisfactory kind of way. One of my favorite science fiction authors, he talks about endings this way. The opposite of the happy ending is not actually the sad ending. The sad ending is sometimes the happy ending. The opposite of the happy ending is actually the unsatisfying ending. That was our comment around from Orson Scott Card around the nature of ending. And if that name sounds familiar, then you might remember that Ender's Game, the movie, is based on Card's work. So we end up here, and it's, it's not that it's a, not a happy ending or not a sad ending or, or, or any other kind of ending in between. It's, it's just that it's unsatisfying. We feel like the whole book of Job has been trying to explain why bad things happen to good people, and good bad people seem to just prosper and keep going on without any kind of consequence. And we end up here and we're like, finally, this is all going to get resolved. It's all going to be explained. It's going to be wrapped up in a nice little bow that we can take with us and feel warm and fuzzy about. And and when we have questions about society and what's going on in the world, we can go, yeah, but you remember? Remember the story of Job? And in the end, God makes everything right. (sighs) Ah. still doesn't feel right. Even now, doing that, it still doesn't feel right. It's unsatisfying. It really, it's that simple? And what we realize is, no, 
It's not. The very fact that we find it unsatisfying should encourage us to, to engage the text at deeper and deeper levels and see what's going on within it. I want to share with you this quote from Schiffendecker. And she says, all English translation of these verses translates God's charge along these lines. You have not spoken about me what is right. But note that the Hebrew can also be translated as, you have not spoken to me rightly, as has my servant Job. This latter translation points out what was true all along. It isn't that Job is, is somehow debating the authority or, or the power of God, the ability to God to, to craft planets and, and cause humanity to evolve out of primordial ooze. That, that's not what Job is doing. Rather, Job is questioning God's sense of justice. And he starts off by talking about God. God is this. God is that. God is something else. And as we move through the, the chapters, what starts to shift is Job stops talking about God and starts talking to God. And it's only when Job does that that God responds. Even in this portion of Scripture, it's not that Job is praying for himself. The response to the, to the epilogue that lists off all of the riches that Job now has, it begins with, Job prayed for his friends. See, the whole piece around it is that it's not self-serving. It's not rooted in the ego it's not rooted in me. It's not, it's not rooted in you. It's actually all about holy mystery. It's all about the Holy One. It's all about God all the time in the book of Job. And as the focus shifts to be more and more about God, the narrative shifts to go along with it. That's part of the challenge in God's response. If we just take it at, at face value as it's put to us in the Scriptures, presented to us as text on page, we miss the nuances and the textures that lie in behind it. It's not that God is saying, it doesn't matter, Job, that your kids died. Look, I've given you ten more. There isn't a parent alive, I believe, that would say that that would be okay. That somehow that would balance the scales. We would always mourn and lament the death of the ten. No matter how beautiful no matter how rich, no matter how successful or how handsome the other ten ever became. Grief would always dwell in our hearts. And so it isn't that God somehow wipes all that away. It's that God is up to something else at the end of the book of Job. Another piece that I came across from Anna Grant Henderson. And she says, this book does not seek to answer the question why good people suffer or indeed why the wicked appear to prosper. It can enable those people who are willing to enter into a relationship with God to have a sense of the mystery and power of God which may help in times of tragedy. God is there to shout at and to be present with us. See, I think that's, that's what the whole book of Job is really about. Most of us have this kind of bartering relationship with God. I'll do this, God, if you could do this for me. I'll do this if you do that. Back and forth, back and forth. I'll tune in every Sunday and go to worship if you just give me that parking spot I've been looking for. I'll help my neighbors if you just give me this first. And it's always predicated upon that. I'll do this, but, but you need to do that. And if you don't do that, it's if somehow we can say to God, well, then I won't do that anymore. 
And rather than treating God as this expansive relationship, we treat it as a very narrow, finite one, one that feels very human. And yet, as Anna Grant Henderson points out, this whole piece is that God is there in the challenges of life. We can rant and rail at God. Because God is also there to be present with us. That's the the piece that Job is trying to, to communicate to us. At least I believe that's part of what Job is trying to communicate to us that even in the challenges of life, we're not alone. God is is present with us. And because God is present with us, there's some hope. We spent 41 chapters believing that this was all hopeless. There There was nothing that could resolve from this. Nothing good could come out of this. How in the world could Job keep walking, keep moving, keep calling out to God, keep trying to be in conversation with God, keep trying to root himself in the holy over and over and over again. It looks hopeless. And yet if you pull back the curtain, what you actually see is a text and a story that is all about hope. It's an actor from a TV show that was pretty popular The title of the show was Once Upon a Time, which kind of makes sense if we're talking about happy ever after. Mary Margaret Blanchard is quoted as having said, believing in even the possibility of a happy ending is a powerful thing. But living with that kind of belief, that's the most powerful thing of all. That's And hope, I believe, when nurtured and sustained, can overcome pretty much anything that we might experience. Any of the challenges that might come our way. When we don't just believe in hope, but actually live in hope. Live knowing that God is present, that God is with us then we can face all the challenges that life throws our way. No matter what restrictions might come our way about how we interact with one another or how many people we can have in our homes. No matter how we we look at vaccinations, no matter how we look at the state of the world, if we have hope, then we can deal with all of those things. We can come face to face with them. We can lament to God about them. We can challenge one another to to lift up our eyes and see what's going on around the world because we have hope. So it might read like an unsatisfactory ending at first glance. It might even read like and feel like somehow we've, we've experienced a bait and switch. We believed it was going this way, it was all set up, and all of a sudden at the very end, nope, something completely different. But if you move beyond that and go back and look at the story of Job through the lens of hope, and the story of Job through the lens of God being present, then I think you come to a place where maybe it's not about happy ever after, but it might be about life ever laughter. And it definitely is about hope ever after. Thanks be to God. Amen.